what have we got here? Well, we've got a mixer, and um, the reason I'm starting with this one is because this is a, an old school split console. Okay, you will hear mixers described as split consoles or inline consoles, and this is a an old Studio Master mix down uh, from the 80s and uh, they're very good mixers if you can get them in good condition and they stand up against anything that's available in the budget market nowadays in my opinion especially for the EQ um, the reason it's called a split console, this type of console is because you've got your input channels in one section which is normally traditionally on the left as is the case on this mixer Okay, so these are all your input channels that receive the incoming musicians playing in the studio Okay. On this side of the mixer, you have got your tape groups, and this is where you monitor um, the signals coming from tape while you're recording. So, hence, it's called a split console because this side is the incoming signals from the musicians, and this side is where you monitor the tracks that you've recorded while you're working. And when you're finally ready to mix, you switch all these in input channels into tape mode and then they receive the signal coming from tape and you do your final mix using the full EQ and all the facilities of these bigger channels but while you're recording you can um, a, set up a monitor mix using these monitor um, tape groups which have a pan and a volume control and that allows you to set up a basic monitor mix to listen to what's coming from tape while you're working Okay, hence a split console Oh, oh yeah, and finally, on the far right is the master section, which has all the inputs and outputs for the main master uh, facilities, such as the the main output going to your studio monitors, the main outputs that are sending uh, from the auxiliaries to effects units and uh, returning from effects units. You've got your master controls for the auxiliary sends. You've got your headphone controls, your monitor speaker output uh, volume control and your master faders and what have you so this is the master section okay so let's take the camera off the stand and go in for a closer look and see how it works okay one second just put that little back on the camera okay so let's have a look at a at a channel now Obviously beginners, when they see a mixer with all these channels on, and this is not a big mixer by any means, uh, they get kind of freaked, you know, oh my god, look at, all the, look at all the knobs, look at all the controls. Well, the thing you've got to remember is that um, with input channels on a mixer, they're all identical. Okay, so if you know one, you know all of them. So the best thing to do when you're approaching a mixer is to ignore the mass of controls everywhere and just look at one channel because once you understand one channel you understand all the channels because they're identical okay so um, I've got a few things plugged into the first four channels here already for some for, for further on in this demonstration but if we sort of look at channel 8 for example here okay this is what is on one cha input channel of this mixer and common to most mixers at the top You've got a mic and a line input. Now you can plug in a keyboard or such item into the line input, anything that's a line level signal, or a microphone can be plugged into this input here. Um, you, there is no switch to determine whether the channel is listening to the line or the mic input. Simply, if you plug into either of these, the channel by default will be listening to whatever is plugged into either of these sockets. Okay, But underneath that, you've got a tape socket and every single channel has a tape socket okay more on that later under that you have a socket called send return now you may see this socket on a mixer labeled insert and basically it's a socket with two signal connectors and a common ground that allows you to send a signal from this channel out to some kind of a processing unit like a compressor or a noise gate and then bring the signal back on the same cable and that allows you to insert a plug into here 
and plug a noise gate or a compressor or, or other type of processor into this signal path so that whatever comes in here has to pass out from the send return socket to the compressor or gate and comes back again and then continues on its journey down the mixer. Okay. This particular mixer also has on every channel a direct out socket which allows you to plug uh, a lead into here and take, a, um, take some of the signal from this channel and send it out to some, somewhere else, wherever you like. Plugging into this direct output does not interrupt the signal flow. The signal will still flow down the mixer, but it allows you to grab what they call in, in the trade a sniff of the signal. It's called taking a sniff, yeah? And it allows you to just grab a bit of that signal and send it off somewhere else to do something else. You could use this direct out, for example, to feed a digital recorder or something, but only from this channel. If you plug in here, or if you plug into this direct out on this channel, it'll only send out whatever's coming in on this channel, okay? Okay, once we've finished with all the um, input sockets and other sockets like that, traditionally the next thing on a mixer will be the switches and buttons at the top of the channel. And uh, this particular mixer has a 48 volt phantom power switch for every single channel, so you can choose to individually switch phantom power on or off for the microphone on every single channel. Uh, cheaper mixers have an overall global phantom power on and off that switches phantom power on or off for all the microphone sockets on the board and you either have them all with phantom power or all without. This particular board allows you to individually apply phantom power to every single mic individually. Whether you need it, you put it on. If you don't, you don't. Underneath that every channel has a tape switch. Now, if you remember, further up the channel, after the mic and line input sockets, there's a tape socket, and every channel has a tape socket. Okay. Now, this is a 16-channel board. There are 16 input channels and 16 tape groups over here. And what you do is you plug your multi-track tape recorder. Track 1 goes into tape 1 socket on channel 1. Track 2 from the tape recorder goes into the tape 2 socket on mixer channel 2. Tape 3 socket takes the connection from the multi-track tape machine track 3 and it goes into the channel 3. You plug in to tape 4 the, tr the fourth track on the multi-track tape recorder playback. So track 1, track 2, track 3, track 4, track 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 from the tape machine those 16 tracks coming back from the tape machine are permanently plugged into these 16 tape sockets one for each channel Okay. now the thing about the mixer is is that while you're tracking the band that's actually receiving incoming signals from the studio where they're playing these channels are used to listen and pass the signal through from the musicians to go to tape. And when you're working, doing the tracking, the recording, you leave these tape buttons in the up position. In other words, they're switched off. That way, these input channels are used to listen to what the musicians are playing coming through the mic and line sockets from the studio. Okay? But when you finish doing your recording and you're ready to mix, you press in all these tape buttons and then each channel is listening to its corresponding playback from the multi-track tape machine. So if you press in tape switch on channel 1 on the mixer when you're ready to mix, this channel will then be listening to the playback from the tape machine track 1. If you press in tape button here on channel 2 on the mixer when you're remixing and when you're ready to do your final mix, this channel is then listening to the playback from tape track 2 and tape track 3 on channel 3 and tape track 4 on channel 4 etc. So it's quite clever because it allows you to keep your multi-track tape machine outputs permanently plugged in without having to unplug them and move them around to these 16 sockets, one for every channel of the mixer. <coughs> um, and um, while you're doing the recording you keep the buttons switched out so that you're listening to the musicians and when you're ready to mix you press the buttons in and then the tape flow, the tape returns from the multi-track flow down these, these channels and you can do your full mix using the full EQ and everything. 
But what happens in the meantime while, when you're monitoring what's coming back from tape while the band is playing? Okay, and that's where this split console, the second half, comes in, these tape groups, okay, and there are 16 of them. And you'll see them here. Monitor 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then above it, 9, 10, 11, 12, up to 16. Okay, so to analyse how the signal flow works in that respect, uh, first of all, we should finish off going down the channel. Um, after the tape button, okay, this particular mixer has a pad switch. Uh, you'll find this on some mixers. That simply reduces the input um, by a pad of 20 dB. It reduces the input signal by 20 dB. And uh, you would press that in if you had a very hot, very loud, very high signal coming in that was overloading the input. Yeah. Then, at the top, after the buttons, you have your gain control, and you can think of this as an input volume. Okay. Below that, you have your EQ. High frequency. There's a sweep mid, and there's a sweep bass on this particular Studio Master, which is why they've got such a sweet sound because you can tune the bass and the mid range. Okay. There's an EQ cut on this particular mixer, which allows you to just drop the EQ out completely, but you won't find that on budget mixers. Below that, you've got your auxiliaries for sending some of the signal out to reverb and uh, delay units and things like that. There are some switches uh, inside the auxiliary, and uh, you've got these five auxiliaries, and you might find, like on other mixers, there's, there's a switch here and there. This is to do with switching the auxiliary into post or pre mode, which means that if it's in uh, if it's switched into up in post mode, it means that this auxiliary here is sending out a signal, um, and if you raise or lower the fader on that channel, it raises or lowers the amount of signal going out of the auxiliary as well. In other words, if you drop the overall level of this channel it drops the level going out of the auxiliary as well. But if you press it into pre, it doesn't matter whether you turn this channel completely down, the same amount of signal will keep being sent out of this auxiliary. Okay. So you've got some auxiliaries here, and then you've got your pan control, okay, left or right, and below that you've got a clipping indicator, which is a little lamp that lights up if you're overloading um, the input amplify gain control up here. If you're overloading the input of the channel, this little light will light up saying that the channel is clipping. Uh, so that gives you a little visual indicator if you're overloading the channel. It also functions as a solo on light. Okay, if I press the solo button, it lights up to tell me that channel is soloed. And the solo button allows you to listen to just that channel and it mutes all the other channels going to your speakers so you can just go, well hang on a minute, what's going on with the guitar? Press the button, listen to the guitar on your monitor speakers and the studio musicians keep on playing, they don't hear uh, the rest of the music being muted, only you hear that because this button only solos that channel to the studio monitors, not to anywhere else. Yeah. Then under that you've got on this particular mixer an on-off switch for the channel. It's always a good idea to choose a mixer with an on-off switch, especially if you're into doing live dubs or anything like that, because you can switch things in and out, you know, which is good. And this one also has an indicator light, which is kind of handy. Now below that you've got these routing buttons. The main left right, pressing that in, brings the signal coming down this channel into the main left right mix on your monitors. Okay. And then below that you've got these buttons. One and two, three and four, five and six, seven and eight. And these buttons allow you to route this channel to the tape groups over here. Okay, if you press in button one and two you're routing this channel to tape group one and two. Okay, if you depress button three and four yeah, you're sending this channel over here to tape group three and four. Yeah. If you depress button five and six, you're sending this channel across here to group five and six. 
and if you depress 7 and 8 you're sending this channel across here to 7 and 8 and also it works so that um, it doubles up so that um, these buttons 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 also send the signal to 9 and 10, 11 and 12, 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 on the tape machine and basically the signal you choose which of the which of the tape groups you're sending to for the channel it sends the signal through some internal cabling to the required pair of tape groups yeah and then that gets sent out from these sockets up here tape outputs to the tape re tape recorder and there are 16 outputs yeah so I think the best thing to do to show how it works is I've got a drum machine wired in on the first four line inputs up here. That's this one, this one, this one and this one, like the line inputs, yeah? And I've got the drum machine set up so it's sending a kick drum into channel one, a snare into channel two, a hi-hat into channel three and a tom pattern into channel four. And I've got four outputs coming from the first four tape outputs they're going across on a loom over to Logic uh, on, actually they're going into an EMU 1820M just here, yeah, and that's going through into Logic, I'll just zoom in, I've got four channels put into record mode and then four playback channels coming out of Logic, out of the EMU, yeah, and going back to the mixer. So. Obviously with a 16 track recorder you'd have 16 tracks and 16 inputs over there and you'd have 16 cables coming back from the tape going into these 16 sockets, 16 tape sockets, one for each mixer channel. And you'd also have 16 tape outputs going from these 16 sockets to your 16 inputs on the tape recorder, okay? <coughs> but just to show you how it works, this will be fine. So if I start the drum machine, okay, now let's go over to channel 1. So, the signal is coming in to the line input here. Okay, the tape switch is in the up position, so the channel is listening to either the mic or line socket. And as there's nothing plugged into the mic socket, it's going to be listening to this plug coming from the drum machine in the line input 1. Okay, this could be a kick drum from a drum kit on a microphone though as well. Okay, so first of all, Okay, set the gain. There's no sound yet, okay? That's because if I go down the channel, I've got to switch the channel on. So I switch the channel on. Okay? Still no sound. That's because the left right button here is switched out. So I switch that in, raise my fader a bit, and you can hear the kick drum. The kick drum is being routed into the main left right bus to my monitors and it's going through the master faders here yeah okay and then there's a monitor control here to turn the volume of the monitors up or down okay so back here what if I wanted to send I'll turn that down for a sec what if I wanted to send this kick drum to tape track one okay well I go to these routing buttons right and I press in tape track one and um, I press into the um, tape group button one and two that means this channel is now being sent to tape group one and two over here okay that's these two tape group one and two <coughs> however how do I control whether or not it's going to one or two. Well, I use the pan control for that. If I pan it fully to the left, the signal will go left to the left side of the one and two group. In other words, to group one only. If I turn the pan to the right, it'll be going to tape group one and two on the right, which means it will only go to tape group two. If I put the pan in the middle, it's going, an equal amount of kick drum will be sent to both tape group 1 and 2. Just let the clock chime there. Okay, so I want to put my kick drum 
to be recorded only on track one of the tape. So with, tr with um, tape group one and two depressed, I pan it hard to the left, raise the volume. Ah, but now what? Well, the problem now is that I've got it panned fully to the left because I want to route it only to group one of this pair. Okay, but that means in my monitor mix that I'm hearing the speakers in the studio, the kick drum is now panned totally to the left, which sounds ridiculous. How can I work like that? Well, what you do in this case is you take the left-right button out here so that you're not monitoring this channel to the monitors anymore. OK? But the signal is still flowing out of this, out to group 1 and 2 because this button is depressed. If I raise the fader, I still can't hear anything because the left-right button is not in anymore, but the signal is being sent out to group 1 and 2 because this button is depressed. And it's going to group 1 because this is panned totally to the left. If I go over here to the tape group, okay, I raise the fader on group 1, and up here you can see on tape group 1, on the meter, I'm getting a signal of the kick drum. Now that is then going out of this tape, you know, tape outputs, tape output 1, and it's going off to feed track 1 on the multi-track, right? But why? I still can't hear it. Well, I've turned off the monitoring, the left-right monitor, on the actual input channel over here, and instead I can monitor the signal on tape group 1 monitor. Right Now, tape group 1 and every other group monitor has a button which says group or tape. With the button in the up position, if I then turn up the monitor volume, I'm now listening to the sound of the kick drum from this tape group. So, the signal is coming down the channel, the left-right for this channel is out, so this channel, the input channel, is not being sent to the, sp to the monitor mixers in the studio, but the signal is being sent to group 1 and 2, it's being sent only to 1 because it's panned left, it's then flowing through an internal cabling inside the mixer to this group, and I then turn up the monitor here to actually monitor the signal. And the beauty of this is, is that the signal is now routed only to this group, not to the one on the right, group 2. So it'll only go here to track 1 on the tape. It's not coming out of track 2 feed to the tape at all. It's not on group 2 at all, only on group 1. But I can adjust the volume for listening to it to the level I want, and more importantly, I can adjust the pan to place that kick drum anywhere in my stereo monitor field in the studio control room so I no longer have a problem with it being panned hard to the left. Okay, So I'll just turn that down. If I then go over and switch in channel 2 up here, the drum machine, the second the snare is coming in on channel 2, yeah? Make sure the tape switch is out. Make sure the gain's at its sort of nominal level. There's a little indicator to show, you know, an average sort of setting for the gain there. OK, and down here, switch the channels 2 in, right? Just check what's on that channel by pressing the left right and it will go to my speakers. There's the snare, OK? Now, I want the snare to go to track 2 of the tape. So, I depress group tape group 1 and 2 button and pan it to the right so that it's going to the right, to number 2 group, OK? Again, the same problem. It's now on the right side of my monitor mix on my studio speakers. So I remove it from this input channel from the left-right mix like that by, by lifting this button, this left-right button, to the out-off position. And now the signal of the snare coming down this input channel is going to tape group 1 and 2, and the pan is sending it to the right. In other words, it's only going to go to group 2. And if I go across here to group 2 and raise the fader, and look up here, there's my, I'll just turn the volume up here on the fader for that channel, All right? and over here on the meter for tape group 2 you can see the snare. Okay, so I'll just turn up a bit louder, yep, get a decent level, there's my level, right? 
I'm getting a decent level. It's just going up into the red, but not right to the top. Okay, back down here, I look at monitor two for this second tape group. There's the group tape button. It's in the up group position, which means I'm listening to the signal flowing out of that group. I turn up my volume, there's my snare. And I can pan the snare anywhere in the mix that I like. Okay, bring up the kick again. Now, there's another advantage to this, which is that if I turn the snare and the, and the kick both down, they're no longer in my monitor mix at all. But check it out up here. The signal going to tape has remained unchanged. Yeah? Because that is being controlled by these faders here. Okay? And also by the faders on the actual input channels where the signal is coming in. But as long as I leave this, once I've got the sound I want for the snare and the kick and I set the level here and here, so I'm getting a good signal to my tape on track one and track two, the kick drum and the snare going to track one and track two respectively, I can then adjust my monitoring for the kick drum and the snare and set them to whatever I like and it will not affect the volume going to tape. So that remains constant and true. Okay, And that's how this group monitoring works. Um, it's quite clever. Huh? So let's bring in the third channel over here, which is a hi-hat. There it is with the left right. Okay, I'll take the left right out. Now, we've already got the kick, grunt, the kick drum going to group one left, which is tape group one. The snare is going to group two, um, is going to tape group one and two, but it's panned to the right, so it's going to group two. So they're already occupied. Tape group one and two are already occupied by the kick and snare, which are going to track one and track two of the tape. So the next item, the hi-hat, we're going to send it to tape track three. So I go down and look at my group buttons. I ignore group one and two because that's already being used to feed track one and two for the kick and snare. And I go to the next button, three and four, depress that, pan the hi-hat to the left, which means it will be going out of the left of this group, which is tape group three. It's then being routed along the internal cabling to the third group here. And if I raise the fader, I start to get my hi-hat signal on the meter for group three. There it is, right? So I set a decent level to send my hi-hat to tape. Yeah, there it is, flickering away nicely. Uh, <coughs> there, on three, yeah, whoops, on three. So you've got kick, snare and, and hi-hat. And now to listen to my hi-hat, I just go to monitor three, make sure the group button is up. So I'm listening to the group and turn up that. And I'm listening to my hi-hat. And again, I can pan the hi-hat anywhere I want in the stereo field. Bring up my snare, bring up my kick. And as I said before, no matter what volume you set these at and where the pan position is in your monitor studio speakers, the signals going to tape remain constant. Yeah? because they're controlled by the faders here. That's set, and you've set a decent level, you leave those alone, okay? And you do your listening controlling here. Okay, so I'll bring in the last item on channel four from the drum machine. Make sure the tape button is in the up position, so we're listening to the line or mic input. Go down here, press in the channel, put in the left-right switch to check what's on that channel. As you can hear, it's a tom riff. OK, I'll take it out of my left-right so that this input channel is no longer being fed to the monitor speakers. We're going to send this tom riff to tape track 4. So we want it to go to tape group 4. So I go to the button 3, 4 for that channel, depress it, and pan it to the right. So the group 3 and 4, feeding tape track 3 and 4, the hi-hat is panned to the left, going to group 3, and the toms are going to the right, which is four, three and four, yeah? Raise the fader a bit, go over here to group four, raise the fader, so I'm sending it out of tape group four here. You can see I'm getting a level, I'll just raise that a little bit more to get a better signal level. Okay, I'll just turn that up a bit, hang on. Over here that is, just adjust the volume here. Okay, lower my fader a bit down here for that group. OK, so there I'm getting a decent level for my toms, flickering around the 0 dB level, yeah. And then to listen to my toms, I just come down to monitor 4 here, 
make sure the group button is up in group mode so I'm listening to the output turn it up there's my tom riff okay so I've now routed a kick drum to tape output one a snare drum to tape output two yeah tape outputs up here yeah hi-hat to three tape track three tom riff to tape track four and you'd carry on like that you know with overheads bass drum etc and now I can adjust my monitor mix using the four groups down here and I'll just put a bit of kick drum a bit of snare a bit of hi-hat and a bit of tom and I can pan the toms where I like and the hi-hats where I like etc etc and of course that doesn't affect the signal going to tape at all okay. I'll turn down my main monitor control over here that's the overall studio control to turn my monitors up and down, you know. Okay, just to quieten that down a bit. Okay, so <coughs> there you can see what, what we've done. And although we're using a drum machine, if you were working in a studio with a mixer like this, this would be the kick drum coming from the drum kit on a microphone, that'd be the snare, that'd be the hi hats, that'd be the toms would be in stereo or they'd be on three individual tracks rather or whatever. Yeah? But basically, we're bringing the sound of the drum kit in. We're feeding it across to the tape groups. It's going out of the cables across the recorder, or in this case, logic. Okay. What happens if you want to listen to the sound off tape? Okay. Because one of the secrets of tape multi-tracking, which uh, perhaps beginners don't realise, I'll just put the camera back on the stand here. Uh, one of the one of the tricks of uh, tape recorder multi-tracking from the old days. is that, yeah, you've got meters and things, right? And you can use the meters on the tape machine and the mixer or a combination of both to get a level using the meters. But at the end of the day, the way, the, one of the, the thing about tape is, is that tape is a sort of, it's not a digital media, yeah? It's a physical media, and it's working on a sort of almost molecular, well, I suppose it is a molecular level because it's little tiny particles of iron oxide on the tape. And you can drive the input of a tape machine, yeah, so that the tape can be, you reach a level at which the tape starts to be saturated, okay? Now you can drive the recording onto a tape very hard until the point where you'll get distortion, but the thing about working with tape is you, if you monitor the signal coming back from tape as you're recording, you're actually hearing the sound coming back from tape that's been recorded you can hear what the tape is, is actually playing back as you're recording. This allows you to drive the tape to a level where you're beginning to get distortion and then just back it off a little bit to get the maximum loudness level that you want. Or, if you want to really drive that tape to sort of get that really nice sort of tape distortion for drums or something, you can push it a little bit further, yeah? But the secret, especially with budget multi-tracks with narrower tape, to getting a good hot level and getting a good signal, is to drive the tape as, as, as hard as you can without distorting it. So you want to be able to listen to the sound coming back from tape while you're recording. And of course, in a situation with this mixer like this, let's say we recorded the drums and then wanted to go on to record the guitar and things, we want to also be able to listen to what we've recorded being played back. So what I've done is... To demonstrate this, as I said, over here I've got Logic set up, right? Now, this is, uh, you can see here the input channels of Logic. The contrast is very bright because I, I've turned the contrast on the camera up so that um, it captures the mixer nice and clearly. But now I'm pointing the camera straight at a monitor. It's, uh, it's a bit bright. But basically I've got the inputs coming into Logic. They're passing through Logic uh, on the ASIO driver for the EMU and coming back these are the outputs flickering so the inputs are coming in and going straight across the outputs and back out okay but what I've done is each channel on Logic, you probably won't be able to see that, but I've added an insert reverb on every channel and I've done that so that we can tell the difference between the sound going out of the mixer and the sound coming back from Logic the sound coming out of the mixer will be the drums dry, they won't have any reverb on but the sound coming back from Logic, which we're using as if it was a tape recorder, will have reverb on each individual instrument, okay? So, how do you listen 
to the sound coming back from tape. Well, if we go to this monitor section again, as we know, if we turn up the monitor control, okay, just turn it down a bit, that's the kick drum, we're listening with the group button here up, we're listening to the sound going out up this group and off to the tape machine. But if I if I depress the group button so it's set to tape, I'm listening to the sound coming back from tape. Okay, so I'll switch all four channels into tape. Now this, if you look up here, this is not affecting the signal going out to the multi-track from the faders. Okay, that remains constant as before. But by switching this into tape, okay, we're not listening anymore to the signal coming from these channels and then up out of the group track, uh, the group um, channels and out to the multi-track. We're listening to these tape inputs along the top, one for each input channel. But they're being routed internally through the mixer over to these monitor controls here. As soon as I press in the tape button for a monitor, I'm listening to these tape returns coming in over here. And that's how this split console works. While you're recording, you want these channels to be carrying the signal from the musicians playing in the studio. So the tape buttons are left in the up position so that these channels are not listening to these tape sockets up here. They're listening to the mic and line sockets, okay? You monitor the channels over here, and you also monitor the tape returns over here. So, for example, if I just turn everything down, that's the kick drum. Okay, I'm listening to the kick drum coming from the input channel here, going out of this tape group and out of that to the recorder. So I'm listening to the sound coming in and then back out again of the mixer, okay? If I switch in the group button, I'm then listening to this connected socket coming from tape track one on the recorder over here. It's being routed internally to this monitor. So it remains, so this is output one to the tape and also return one from the tape if I just press the group tape button in and out, yeah? So if I press it in, turn up the monitor control, you can now hear the kick drum has got reverb. Likewise, the snare. If I press in the tape button, I'm listening now to the sound of the snare coming back through tape two socket here. Okay? And that will have reverb on it because I've put reverb on the channel on Logic, yeah? If I turn the group tape button to group, switch it out, so I'm listening to the sound coming up through this from the mixer channel and going out to the tape, it won't have any reverb on switch the group in, so I'm listening to tape, and now we're listening to the sound coming back from Logic, and you can tell the difference because one does and one doesn't have reverb, it does, the outgoing signal doesn't have reverb, and the one coming back from Logic does. Yeah? So that's how these group buttons work. They allow you to monitor the signal going out as you're recording, but also by pressing these group buttons in, it allows you to listen to the signal being played back from tape. And again, you can adjust your mix and your pan, and it doesn't in any way affect the signals going out to the tape. They remain fixed and constant, okay? Okay, so that's how the split console works. When you have finally finished all your recording, and you're ready to mix properly, because remember, these are just monitors. They're, they give you the ability to, to adjust the volume and, and the pan position, and it's a basic monitoring to do what it says, just to monitor while you're working, yeah? And if you're recording a kick drum, you'll generally, uh, you'll generally set the EQ to get the EQ for the kick drum sounding as you want it going to tape, and you might want to tweak the EQ later when you're mixing or something like that. But at the time you're monitoring, you don't really need EQ on the monitor controls, you just, you've got them on the inputs, okay? But when you're ready to do your final mix, then you want to get access to greater facilities to tweak the sounds and EQ the sounds and get the whole mix sounding really good. Or you might want to do a really creative mix where you're applying really sort of extreme EQs or things like that. And also, of course, when you're mixing properly, 
and do your final mix, you need access to your auxiliaries so you can send some of the signal for each instrument out to a reverb or a delay and add effects. Again, these monitor channels, well, they have an auxiliary to feed the musicians so that they can hear what's going on and things like that. But they don't have, um, they don't have like all the auxiliaries. They've just got a couple, yeah, which you can use to add a monitoring effect or something, yeah. So, if I stop the drum machine as if the musicians had stopped playing, okay, and go over to Logic, and I've got some drums which I recorded earlier in Logic. Again, this probably won't show up, but uh, if I hit play, we'll then be listening to the sound recorded as if it was on a multi-track being played back. I hope the cat's trying to get in on the app. Okay, <laughs> so the machine is now playing back as if it had four tracks recorded and it was playing back. I'll turn up my monitor control here. Now I can still monitor them over here and get my monitor mixed by depressing the group tape button so it's set to tape. So these four recorded tracks can now be listened to in playback mode in basic monitoring and adjust the pan and the volume while I continue to record other things using the other channels on the mixer that haven't yet been recorded to a tape track. Okay? But when I'm finally ready to do my final mix, okay, I'll take these um, group buttons out. Okay. Now I'm ready to do my final mix. And you would have, you know, all your 16 outputs from the tape machine plugged into here. So now we're ready to do the final mix. We're not going to listen to what's coming back from the tape using these monitors anymore. Okay, we're going to go over here and press the tapes. Oh, hang on, getting a bit of feedback there. We're going to just take these out. We're going to go along and we're going to put the channels, the input channels, into tape mode using the tape button. That now means that every individual channel will be listening to its tape socket. Channel 1 will be listening to tape return 1, channel 2 will be listening to tape return 2, channel 3 will be listening to tape return 3 and 4 and 5, etc. That now means I can mix the whole thing using the full channel facilities, the EQs and all the auxiliaries and everything. And uh, I'll just lower these faders a bit down here on the first four channels. And now. I can bring in these left-right switches so that each channel coming back from tape is into the monitor mix and set the pan where I want them like that and then I can start to do my proper mix. I'll take these routing buttons out now. You don't have to but uh, you don't need them in anymore. So I can raise my kick drum on channel 1 coming back from the tape. I can adjust the EQ It's a bit of a crackly desk this because it's old and it's been in storage for ages. But you can see basically I've got access to my gain, I've got access to my full EQ, yeah, I've got access to my auxiliaries if I want to add things. I can use the um, send return socket to add compressors and things or whatever, yeah. So there's my kick drum. I can now bring in my snare, pan that where I like, tweak the EQ up here. Bring in my hi hat on channel three, pan it where I like, roll off the bottom, add some treble or whatever, you know. Bring in my tongs on channel four. I think that channel's a bit dodgy, but you know, there you go. Basically, I'm remixing then. I'm doing my final mix. I'll just turn the monitor control down over here. And that's the beauty. That's how, that's how a split console works. And um, your tape machine is permanently plugged in up here to the 16 channels, one output from the tape corresponding to each line, to each um, channel on the mixer. But while you're recording, the input channels are listening to the musicians playing in the studio using the mic or line sockets yeah and these input channels are being used to capture the sound of the musicians and route them out using the routing switches to the required tape group which is then sending the signals out to the recorder 
you do your basic monitor mixing using the monitor section for the 16 different tape groups yeah and when you're ready to do your final mix you just drop all the input channels into tape mode and without having to unplug your tape machine every channel then is receiving its corresponding tape track for a full 16 track mix with all the facilities of the EQ and the auxiliaries available to you. And further to that, once you're not using these tape groups anymore to send things to the multi-track, you've got this, on this particular mixer, you've got these additional 16 auxiliary line inputs, okay, which allow you to use these tape groups as an additional 16 channels. Okay? Um, so you've got more inputs which you can use for bringing in things like MIDI equipment, keyboards and things, you know. And um, when it's in this particular mode, if you switch these buttons in, you've got a basic two-band EQ um, for the first eight channels. Yeah. So in effect, you're getting 16 channels of tape recording and a further eight channels with basic two-band EQ for bringing, in, um, for bringing in, you know, up to eight stereo keyboards um, with basic EQ and blend them into the mix as well and, and uh, you'll control their level using these faders in the mix. So in effect it becomes then a 24 channel board for mixing. Um, yeah, pretty cool, huh? So that's basically how uh, a split console works. Input and tape groups split in half. But anyway, that's how a basic old school split console works. And um, that's the end of tutorial one, and um, we'll add we'll add another one soon about an inline console. Yeah. Okay. Cheers.